Diverged in the yellow wood, and if you know it, say it with me. <laughs> Two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long, I stood and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other just as fair, and having perhaps a better plane because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as far as that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two rows diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Our first reader will be Laura Lamar. Touchstones, lodestones, key 
keeping my feet on the ground. The last poem I have for you is a haiku um, called Platonic Intimacy. They are familiar and move like longtime lovers. Hands brush, eyes meet, smile. Um, up next, we have Jenna Ray. Gentle branches cover me with shade. The leaves fall from the tree as autumn fades. I hear the crinkling leaves and watch them fly as wind blows them from trees and to the sky. The solid trunk gives me stability and knots hold ropes so tightly to the tree. My wooden swing provides a place to rest while wind and wood and colors do their best. To give my soul relief is why I come to hide myself in refuge from the sun. I swing and breathe the air upon my face as green turns red and brown and orange with grace. God looks down on me as from my heart I pour. His gift to me is this strong, firm signal. And my next poem is called Ocean Night. We wanted just to see the stars twinkling on a warm spring night. We set off laughing, smiling, hands held tight until we reached the sea, black as death and threatening rain. We only had ourselves to hold. The walkway darkened. Hold the light, I said. Fog blocked stars from shining, and the air smelled of rain. Don't be afraid, he said. The night has no power over us. Not even the sea can separate lovers' hands. The endless beach sifting through our hands, we search for shells to hold. Crashing waves seem endless as sea met sky in a dark abyss broken only by stars. As we grew accustomed to the night, we felt the sky's first drop of rain. It started slowly, then faster it rained. On our heads and we laughed. By hand constructing a towel tent, blocking out night's fury and sealing in love's warmth. We held each other close. The only stars were in our eyes, and we were all the downpour stopped, with the crashing sea surged on. We looked up at a rainless sky as fog opened, revealing stars. He smiled and grabbed my hand, leading me down the beach, holding tighter than death holds the night. For an hour he was my knight, leading me through the crashing sea. There was nothing like him as he held me close in the falling rain. And now sea and sky were in our hands, twinkling full of lovers' stars. And the night brought more rain, and the sea left our hands but our love held the stars. And then this poem is called Planner. Columns collect to do's with whom's. Lists layer firsts, seconds, thirds. Punctual perfection confines demands. Organized only successes accomplishments. No room for error. And then my last poem is called Sunday. So selflessly given unto us, a son, a savior, a king, hope yeah. arises. And next we be the higher job. of maroon mixed with faded shades of forest, seen by none other than restricted bookshelves who greedily play after yellows and greens. Our viewing is read and the true beauty awaits, with texture and tinted mystery on the its face. Um, and then this poem is called, If Only You Knew. If only you knew your worthiness, your usefulness, your relevance. If only you knew your loveliness, your truthfulness, your excellence. You are my daily dignity, 
my nightly necessity, my perfect prosperity. If only you knew how I rely on you, how I expect of you, how I believe in you. I hope you never deceive me, never unleave me, never leave me. If only you could be a part of me, my kind, cultured, sweet-scented coffee. <laughs> around their fingers, and the title mediates all wagers and doubts, because a story's success is on the line, and the bed of fingers beats to the shelf. Uh, this next one's titled, I Dream. To play the page, to cheer the ear, of living up to writer's past, the newest brand of poetess. But yet my doubt still creeps and crawls, the push that sends me into falls, of spirit, pride, and confidence. I rack my brain for lines and rhymes, go after it with swords and knives, but nothing seems to break the hold on stories rising to be told. So here I sit and contemplate how strong these struggles hold my fate, to write which fulfill all my dreams. I wish it were more. This was titled Once by the Field. Tangled and wild it rested, ages of grass all represented, wispy weeds dirty dandelions, towered by free flowing grasses. There the earth relaxed. There it slumbered in a bed of concrete, undisturbed by the day surrounded, curled air, stubble cheeks of gravel roads, leering lights from lanky posts. It was vacant, yet treasured, held sacred by baseball gloves and the yards of kite strings, the trampled trails and picnic pits. But it couldn't rest forever. Surfacing from sleep, sweet dreams to piercing shovels and stakes, industrializations, torturous tools, it clung to the promise of purpose without rest. This is titled Ripples. Gentle ripples set to beat, sprightly seagrass swaying to and fro, ebb and flow, a simple sunlight disco. And when the moon tucks the sun under starlight sheets, to and fro, ebb and flow. The dancers surely know they can count to the midnight toe to keep their sweetest toe. Nature's satisfaction is revealed in the way yeah. And this last one's titled Perfect Stranger. Across this table, not but two feet away, slowly sipping sweet tea, diligently working, you perch your head on your fingertips, my mind races. Twist of your pen, a glance now and again, yet you never say a word. A quaint coffee shop and it's just our world for these two hours of reflections across this mirror of the table. I part my lips slightly, work to utter a word, snap my teeth together. It's better this way. You will leave, and I will know you by the sweet teeth sweating, your checkered shirt, and the few hours that our spirit shape. And next we have the page This one is called the Tiny Bone. Um, in this place, my favorite of all, the smell, vivid, bold, lively, clean. 
When my eyes shut and breath fills my lungs, I am here, in the midst of perfection and love. My ears perk up to sounds of wind moving, carrying, and filling up life. Simple and And it embraces me, this life. It holds me tight. It squeezes until I realize that I'm not alone. My eyes wander, tracing up the trunk of the miles, and as the sky begins, there at the top I see it. A skyline made of thick green age, God's chorus. Trees, glorious trees, singing praises to their creator. The ground bears evidence of their presence, brown, broken, crunchy, new life. They are memorable memory holders. Because when I find them and carry them with me, I can close my eyes and picture their mothers. Thick green aged God's chorus. And I close my eyes and hold this memory. I swear I can smell the vivid, bold, lively green. And our next one is titled, Let the Water Hold You. Um, my mind thinks blue and then shakes, because blue simply just does not do it. Rich flow of Arctic ice splashing my face. Greenish, bluish, foamish, icish, strongish. No, that doesn't do justice. The game is to let the water hold you, embrace you, until the piercing waves win. Because trust me, they will always win. Sending you running as fast as your legs will take you, numb and stinging, body covered in goosebumps. But for those few algal moments, greenish, bluish, foamish, icish, strongish, held you with the ferocity that you meant by no person. The, the water may win, but the game was successful. Um, and the last one written by me is called Genocide. Um, I beg you family to look around to see the trees that have fallen down. Please hear their cry, I ask you to. Please just try, I ask you to. Mountainous definition of God's glory, being murdered, stripped of his story. Blasted to pieces and broken apart, truly breaking God's own heart. Mocked to destroy, blacking a voice without even giving a choice. We say Christianity is about saving souls with eyes shut tight to these massive holes. These mountains are pieces of holy art, yet we watch them die without a start. If we have to speak up for the oppressed, creation is dying, there's no time for this. And then the last one isn't written by me, it's written by E. Cummings, which is inspiring poem in the um, It's called This Amazing Day. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping green the spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I who have died am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and love and wings and of the gay, great happening and a little bit of earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, and any lifted from the knowable nothing, human merely being, doubt unimaginable you? Now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are awake. Um, and next we have Laura Young. Tone and flex the precious joy as you excitedly exclaim, Yet bitterness is all I feel. You love the sound of your own voice, your mouth is speaking truth sincere, yet leaving no space for my words. I interject, yet I'm not heard. My second one is called Coffee. A scalding, succulent sip means more than a bitter breakfast or a warm winter. It is my morning alarm, my midnight madness, my main motivation. It is a conversation keeper and the best brewer of many memories. All right, so the next one's a little longer. It's called, He Says I'm a Balloon. He says I'm a balloon. He says I attempt to drift away while he holds my rope, making me stay. He says each day I float farther, but as he pulls harder, his hands clutch tighter, his nails dig deeper <clears throat> into his flesh. He bleeds. He says it's painful to let me go, for he will see the scars that remain. But as he bleeds, his weakness overcomes. He lets me go. He watches as I float higher into the atmosphere, so joyful, so free from the scars he must bear. My joy overwhelms him. He heals. I float toward the sky weightless, swimming through air, void of cares, until I look at what I left behind. He's gone. The low air pressure chokes my mild exterior shrinks at the thought of loneliness. He is oxygen. So my next one's called Victory. 
victory. And he hung lonely, just a rugged cross for comfort. Yet in his loneliness, he cried out, for true comfort would only be provided by the Father who placed him there. He hung lonely, just a rugged cross, stained precious blood. He fought, he bought, he won. He is risen. And I have one more, and it's a haiku. <coughs> Poetry is art, defined by its creator. Interpret this. And now it's Joy Speaks. My first poem today is called Sestina for the Blue Glow. Like a shadow crept the blighted white, which dwelt within the glaucous fen. It rose up in the gloomy gloam to forage for a glowing gleam, to permeate the craggy cavity and convert it to a gainful glen. He sought near and far that gainful glen, that wandering soul of the blighted white, constrained with a curse to his craggy cavity at the very heart of the glaucous fen. Long forth he sought the glowing gleam, but remained doomed to the gloomy gloam. And how he hated the gloomy gloom, dreamed in darkness of the gainful glen, dreamed ever long of the glowing gleam, that poor accursed and blighted white, as he dwelt within the cloudless bend at the cave long called the craggy cavity. One day he climbed from the craggy cavity, as it was his time that gloomy gloom, and he gandered forth in that glaucous bend in search of that dear gainful glen, and at last he saw that blighted light, the light he sought the glowing gleam. He gazed long upon the glowing gleam, keen to be carried to his craggy cavity, that very soul the blighted white. But how to gladden the gloomy glow, to convey and make a gainful glen at the very heart of the glaucous fen. Deep within that glaucous fen, he reached and grasped the glowing gleam, held in his hand the gainful glen, hope in his heart the craggy cavity, and then slipped the gloomy glow that ground down the blighted light. No more today exists a glaucous fen, only a craggy cavity. The glowing gleam has replaced the gloom and glow, and in the gainful glen gambles the blighted white. My next poem is called The Drowning of Harriet Shelley, First Wife of Percy. Harriet Shelley was the first wife of Percy Shelley, a famous British poet of the Romantic era. After Percy abandoned her for the woman who eventually became Mary Shelley, the writer of Frankenstein, Harriet, pregnant by a lover, drowned herself in the Serpentine River in Hyde Park. It is December. The sunless sky reflects the Serpentine winding. I think of what was and sigh. Though it's been a year, I'm finding. I think of what could have been, the sharing of blissful moments beside. Instead, my life has fallen, a star to sing, darker and darker in this park hide. The children, they have his eyes. I see his soul staring back from them. I'd once seen favor and watched it die, and now my life is moonless and dim. The mutability of love is merciless, like the breath of Boreas blowing upon a stark life merciless that had once been hopeful glowing. I was 16 when we ran and traveled as far as Scotland, and my heart had led me astray. Love is gone, color is gone, my vitality. My schoolgirl school dreams have broken down, Perhaps this will show him my reality. With this leap in the waters I drown and embrace my bleak mortality. The next poem is called Everyone Goes On and it speaks to modern day slavery. When regret slashes a pericardium like a brick blade and no one is the wiser. When other sees the happiness that was yours and they blossom. When your adversary is the golden hero celebrated and you are the coward. When desolation feasts like winter upon your soul and you shrivel. When undeserving men do not get your just deserts and you need them. When the sun doesn't surge over your atrophied branches and you perish. When the storms crack your masts and tear your sails and you founder. When you run as far away as possible but are captured and there is no freedom. You are a slave to the vices. You are a slave to the world. You are alone in your bondage, and everyone goes on eating and drinking as if there is never such a thing as slavery. My last poem.
on this foggy ocean craft. There is an ocean craft with my name on it, a ship with sails the shade of the setting sun. It rides the damask and flaxen waters cast under the evanescent stars evening light. It wanders the waves like the wayfarer, led by the west's warm winding wind, over swirls and sprays of saline blue, where melodious mermaids skim. The murmur of the music musters my mind, and the flitting flags fly forth, calling my conscience like a compass to come, a magnetic messenger of north. The strand, the shore where the ship will sail in, and who stretches our snowy silver surface to silver sand. Call when it comes, I'll careen to the coast, and I'll sail to a faraway. That concludes this portion of the reading. Um, before we let you go, I have a first announcement. Um, Bethel's letter, literary magazine called Co Weevil is accepting submissions now until April 19th. We're accepting fiction, nonfiction, poetry, art, and music. Um, email your submissions to co submissions at gmail.com. family of ministers. His father was a minister, his grandfather was a minister, even his great-grandfather uh, preached under trees during the uh, time of slavery. So prayer is really what I think uh, kept King going. And there's a moment called the kitchen table moment when King just almost gave up. He decided that it wasn't worth it. And he really, uh, he sat at the kitchen table and he prayed and he just felt like uh, God spoke to him and it what kept him it, that particular moment kept him going. So this is about um, prayer and what you King. And the form is called Prayer Power. Uh, there's a quote by King. He says, when my, with my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. Prayers kept him company at night. Prayers dressed him in starch shirt, Sunday suit and steadfast soul. Prayers pushed him forward, pulled him through barricades and barriers, hands clapping Rosa Parks, Andy Young, and Beth Abernathy. Prayers whispered a letter in a Birmingham jail, propelled him on a pilgrimage, doubts, curses, and burning crosses. Prayers lined worn out shoes like newspapers with a high step for Jesus, anointing out of Bama Rose with visions of justice. Salty prayers drip from speeches, steam from hurting hearts, Lord, seasoned and filled silence. Prayers hitch rides on songs. Prayers led the way, past barking dogs and trampling troopers. Prayers march like the Holy Ghost through bloody beatings. Prayers rose like angels, rose like angels, lifted Martin from his knees and over a mountain. Thank you so much for coming out. On April the 23rd, uh, we will be celebrating Shakespeare, and there will be a reading of Shakespeare's work here in the library. So come out again. Thank you.